appreciated. Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us. My name is Fred Sala. I'm the chief scientist here at Snorkel AI. I'm also a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and I've been involved with the Snorkel project since back in its inception. Really excited to join all of you folks today and talk a little bit about what we call enterprise alignment. Also joining us is Tom Walsh. Tom, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Tom Walsh. I'm a senior research scientist at Snorkel AI, and I've been here for about six months now. Uh, so my main focus over that time has been on programmatic techniques for aligning and specializing LLMs, and some of which we'll talk about today. Uh, before Snorkel, I was in uh, financial services, uh, legal tech, and then doing a PhD at the University of Oxford. So yeah, Fred, back to you, I think. Yeah, all right. So I'll briefly introduce the agenda for what we'll talk about today. We'll first start kind of discussing why we're interested in enterprise alignment and why it's an important problem. And for that, we'll briefly talk about alignment as kind of one of these very big topics that are very exciting in the AI space. Um, we'll discuss what's different about enterprise alignment, and we'll talk through some of the challenges that we face. Then we'll talk about Snorkel's approach, and we'll include a bunch of results that we're very excited about. Afterwards, I'll very briefly talk about some of the next pieces that we're going to be excited to share in the near future. Um, and then finally, we'll take some questions at the end. All right, let's dive in. So first, we'll talk about why we care about enterprise alignment and why you should care. And just in a nutshell, a one-line definition of what enterprise alignment is, is simple. We take alignment, which is really very broadly about AI systems that are safe and comply with policies. And we want to make sure we can do these for business, enterprise, organization level settings. Um, before we talk about enterprise alignment, here's a very, very short introduction to alignment more broadly. So basically, the idea of alignment is to make sure that our AI systems, and by these we mean kind of very generally systems that might involve a large language model component, but not only, we want to make sure that they operate consistent with the kind of things that we'd like to have as humans. That means we'd like them to take our instructions. That means we want them to have the same goals as us. That means we want them to behave according to our values. It means we'd like to satisfy, for example, ethical considerations. It means that as a society, our norms should also be encoded in these systems, and they should behave in a way consistent with them. It also basically means that we'd like to prevent them from exhibiting harmful behavior and to make sure that we promote beneficial types of behaviors. And just as a kind of very short note, there is this simple triple H definition that we often use. We'd like these AI systems to be helpful, to be honest, and not to do harm. And what we mean here by harm are things like we want to make sure that these systems don't produce toxic behavior, don't produce biased or unfair outcomes. So all of these things are kind of things that we'd like to be able to ensure with our AI systems just very broadly. And to make it a bit more concrete, many of the systems we're talking about they interact with users by taking instructions. And it's possible to kind of present very harmful instructions. And in those cases, what we'd like our system to be able to do is at the very least to refuse to answer those kinds of instructions. Now, the reason why alignment has become such a powerful kind of idea is that in the past, a lot of our focus was on predictive systems, in which case we could always use metrics like, for example, accuracy to gauge how high quality our predictive systems were for particular tasks. But as we started working more and more with things like large language models or generative AI more broadly, in that case, we really have to deal with kind of other metrics that are not as simple as predictive accuracy and are more tracking the behaviors and the outcomes of these models. So this is why alignment has become a major area. It's extremely important, both in practical applications of AI systems, but also in the research space as well. So this was all a very, very short introduction to alignment more generally. Now we'll make this more specific to enterprise settings for AI systems. And what this basically means is that we want AI systems that are functioning within organizations or companies to be consistent with kind of similar things. So the goals of the company, the ethical standards of the particular area the organization is in. And of course, very importantly, we'd like to make sure that these systems satisfy regulatory requirements. So this means that for enterprise alignment, we're going to build on the general alignment setting, but we're going to have a lot more complexity to deal with all of these things within the enterprise space. And this is something that we're going to apply both to internal applications, 
So AI powered systems that help employees, but also to external client facing applications as well. And just as an example that we'll follow up on and that Tom will describe, we would like, for example, an LLM powered system to refuse a non-compliant employee request. So we might have some policy and this policy is gonna specify exactly what is an acceptable and unacceptable request. We wanna make sure that our LLM powered system is gonna be able to refuse all those requests that are not compliant with a policy. Okay, so how does this actually look? Basically, whenever we use large language models, large pre-trained models and other such systems, kind of within our enterprise settings, we often have these fairly complex pipelines. We typically cannot use these just directly out of the box. Instead, we have to build a larger set of guardrails for them. And here's just one very simple example of such a pipeline. We'll typically have a user and we'll have to authenticate that user to make sure they're authorized to use the system. They'll craft an initial prompt that will ultimately get sent to a language model. Before it gets sent, it has to be sanitized. It has to be classified. We might even have it interact with a retrieval augmented generation system, and that will put it in a position to retrieve external data as well. And all of these things will be used to create a final prompt that gets sent to a language model. We'll want this language model to be aligned with the specific definition of enterprise alignment we've been getting at. We'll have it produce a response for us, and then at the other end, we'll also have to sanitize these responses before we have the final output that it'll produce. So there's a good bit of complexity here, and that's gonna drive a lot of our approaches for making sure that these systems are indeed aligned in our sense of enterprise alignment. And as we'll see, this is gonna bring up a bunch of challenges. Some of these things are challenges that we face with alignment more generally, but a lot of them are gonna be specific to this enterprise alignment setting. And really what's very unique about the setting and what makes things quite hard is the fact that a lot of our requirements, preferences, and kind of general policies will shift over time. And this is something that's very true within a very dynamic enterprise setting. And it's much less true typically for alignment in other situations. And the reason why this is a big challenge is really getting into kind of the details of how we perform alignment. And I'll give a brief overview and then Tom will tell us more about this. But very roughly, any alignment approach will typically have two components. One is an actual algorithmic technique that will make the language model or other model actually be aligned. But the other component, which is often the bottleneck, is gonna be the data that we use for alignment. And this data is often crafted manually, typically by subject matter experts who know exactly what's gonna be aligned against. Now, this is a very expensive process. Unfortunately, alignment data sets are few and far in between, and they're often not at a huge scale precisely because of the cost of crafting and developing that much data. It's a very, very intensive process. Now, the trouble for enterprise alignment too is that every time there's some change, every time there's a policy that has to be updated, every time we want to shift some requirement, it means that we have to restart this process, create and develop more data and reperform the alignment procedure. So this is kind of a very large amount of complexity and this data issue becomes really a prohibitive aspect of enterprise alignment. Now here at Snorkel, we've pioneered a lot of aspects of automating data development. We call a lot of these approaches programmatic techniques or programmatic approaches. They're far more efficient. We've done these successfully dating back quite a while in other settings like supervised learning, but we believe and we're really excited to share results that show that this is also the right way to unlock enterprise alignment capabilities as well. And now with that, I'm gonna pass it off over to Tom, who's gonna to share a lot of results that we're really excited about for how you perform this programmatic development process to achieve enterprise alignment. Thank you, Fred, uh, for the introduction to enterprise alignment there. I'm gonna talk about uh, our process of how we've approached this problem programmatically. And then we're going to talk about some results that we had in three domains, uh, specializing large language models towards the real world policies that are applicable. So first off, as Fred mentioned, uh, constructing data for alignment, specifically enterprise alignment, is very expensive if you're doing it manually. You need to understand all of the policies that are applicable and shape those into 
data sets that are suitable for supervised tuning or more complex preference optimization techniques. The focus of what we're going to talk about today is how we've approached constructing preference data sets. And you can see an example of what preference data looks like here and how we've approached that programmatically so we can do it at scale and how we can allow for flexibility. So starting off from a, a user prompt or a user request, what we want to encode in our preference data is you know, how an LLM should respond and how it shouldn't respond. And ideally, can we make the model behave in a way that is safe and compliant? To start off with, I'll talk about some of the techniques we actually use to sort of modify, to train the model uh, and make it sort of align with enterprise objectives. And you can use these for general uh, alignment as well. The one you may have heard about most, supervised fine tuning or instruction tuning, uh, it takes instruction and gold standard response pairs. So here you have to outline for every instruction how you want the model to respond. So this is a very straightforward technique. However, any noise that exists in your data set sort of corrupts the uh, final model. So we can use it to increase the likelihood of the desired tokens, the, the ones in your gold standard responses. But if there's some imperfections there, it can also raise the likelihood of undesirable tokens. But the technique isn't perfect. Building upon that is some technique called direct preference optimization. This was introduced by a team at Stanford last year and uses preference data sets that outline for a given instruction, a preferable response, the chosen response, and a rejected response. So how you want the LLM to not respond. And in there is encoded a preference. So we use this to increase the likelihood of the desired tokens being generated but we also use it to reduce the likelihood of the undesired tokens being generated. So unlike supervised fine tuning, we can control both. When you're doing alignment, typically you would do supervised tuning and then maybe you would do DPO on top. This year, a new technique was released called ORPO, so odds ratio preference optimization. And this combines uh, supervised fine tuning and pre pre preference optimization into a single step. And the authors show that in certain scenarios, this can outperform DPO, and it's more computationally efficient than doing both steps independently. And we'll show later on uh, how we use DPO first, and then we chose ORPO as we found it was more uh, performant in our downstream tasks. The final pieces of terminology to introduce um, are how we also proceed with synthetic data generation and alignment. The first is the concept of strong to weak distillation. We want to be able to take a strong model. So throughout these experiments, it's GPT-40. So with strong to weak distillation, we want to understand how we can use our strong instruction following model to produce synthetic data, very grounded synthetic data to help um, improve a weaker model. And in this case, uh, we're, we're looking at Mistral 7B. And the final technique we'll introduce is called SPIN self-play fine tuning. This is a very interesting technique where we can get the weaker model to generate its own data and use that for training. And we use that as a comparative point to help move towards the responses of the stronger model. And uh, we'll show some diagrams of how that works later on. To start off with, I'll talk through our workflow. So how do we construct synthetic preference data? So all of this, is grounded in real world uh, organizational policies, rules, or codes of conduct. On the top right, I've got a fictional example of what these policies might look like. So you understand where the policy comes from, you understand its written content, and it might outline what is acceptable or unacceptable. So in this case, we have an example of a policy that deals with the acceptance of gifts in a financial institution. Throughout this synthetic data generation, we're generating both instructions and preference pairs. And we found that generating very diverse, high quality uh, synthetic instructions required some SME intuition about how to approach the problem. To achieve this, we inject SME knowledge, we keep SMEs in the loop by using them to help develop 
uh, taxonomies that guide how we're going to augment the instructions to inject some domain specific knowledge. We make the assumption that our strong model is very good at following instructions and generating data that exhibits compliance. So in this case, we generate an instruction. So this would be an example of a request from a user. And then we generate how our LLM should respond to this. So ideally, for compliant requests, the response should say, it's compliant, here's why. For non-compliant requests, it should flag, you know, what's wrong with the user request. We use the weaker model under the assumption that it's going to respond poorly to non-compliant instructions. And we generate synthetic instruction response pairs there. Together, we have an instruction and a pair of responses that exhibit both compliance and non-compliance. And through using ORPO, we can align our LLM to produce compliant responses. So we move towards compliance and we optimize it away from uh, poor performance and non-compliance. I mentioned earlier that we wanted to keep SMEs in the loop and we do this through taxonomy guided data augmentation. So here's just one example of some of the taxonomies that we use during synthetic data generation. The SME here has identified one aspect that drives user behavior, and that's perhaps their underlying behavior that they exhibit. You can broadly break this down into compliant and non-compliant behaviors. And the SME has written out some traits associated with you know, what they may exhibit in terms of compliant behavior and some ways that they act in non-compliance. So for example, non-compliant behavior could be that the individual making a request to the LLM doesn't understand the policies. And we use this to augment the instructions when we're generating them. We're framing this as a preference optimization task. So when we're training our model, we use these preference pairs where the chosen response we're framing as the correct way to respond to a prompt from the user. So in this case, it needs to identify is the user request compliant or not? And ideally, although not shown here, we want it to include a citation to the applicable region within the policy documents. Similarly, we want to move away from the rejected responses that don't understand user requests in the context of the organizational policies. So in preference optimization, again, we're increasing the likelihood of the desired tokens being generated, the desired response being given, and we're reducing the likelihood of the undesirable tokens being generated. More specifically, we're using ORPO. I mentioned earlier that ORPO takes ideas from both supervised fine tuning and preference optimization and combines them into a computationally efficient uh, single optimization step. For supervised fine tuning, the component there, we're taking the chosen response to be the gold standard response. So supervised fine tuning is performed using the prompt and chosen response pair. The odds ratio preference objective is done between the chosen response and the rejected response. And in testing, we found ORPO to outperform DPO uh, when measured against our downstream tasks. And this is consistent with the experiments run by the authors in the context of general alignment tasks. So I recommend reading the paper. Spin is the final component. So this is self-play fine tuning. The chosen responses here are fixed. These are generated by the strong model once. The rejected responses, we iteratively regenerate them over time. These are generated by the weak model that is hopefully getting stronger. And the idea is that the model can learn from its own training data. So we regenerate the rejected responses. They're probably going to be weaker than the chosen responses. And there's some signal in between there about our preference that the LLM can use during optimization to improve its own data. For evaluation, we looked at two dimensions. We want the LLM to respond correctly. It needs to understand what compliant behavior looks like and what non-compliant behavior looks like. So the first is detection accuracy. Non-compliant user requests should be flagged, but compliant requests should be accepted. We want the LLM to provide a written description as to whether the request from the user in the prompt is acceptable or, or unacceptable. That can be framed as a simple predictive task. One of the uh, very strong reasons to use an LLM is to provide reasoning 
to inform the user about why what they are doing is either compliant or non-compliant. So in the rationale provided by the LLM, we wanted to explain within the context of the organizational policies why the user is acting in a compliant way or a non-compliant way. And one way we measure the accuracy of the rationale is understanding if it provides a correct citation to the underlying policy documents. So you can see exam examples of that on the right hand side here. So we were looking at producing specialized models in uh, the domains of finance uh, and insurance and in healthcare. Within financial services, we wanted to produce a specialized LLM that was a compliance aware chatbot. So this should understand the applicable internal policies and external regulatory requirements uh, for a chatbot that should be used or could be used by a financial analyst. Within insurance, we wanted to produce a claim handling system. So this is a chatbot that has been instilled with the specific insurance policies applicable to an insurance company. And in this case, we're using uh, automotive insurance policies. So it should understand if a claim is valid given the policy or is invalid. For healthcare, we were looking at a healthcare provider and we wanted to produce a policy aware chatbot that could be used for question answering for employee frequently asked questions. And in the case of all three of these domains, we're using real world policies. And in each of them, we're applying our programmatic workflow to produce synthetic preference data to specialize our large language models. And we're doing it in a very scalable manner and avoiding the need for expensive manual human annotation. Within financial services, we produced a compliance aware chatbot. So we frame this as a chatbot that would be receiving requests or questions from financial analysts. We aligned it against industry standard policies and regulations. And what we found through evaluation is that the base model, Mistral 7B that you can grab off hugging face, didn't perform particularly well when trying to identify non-compliant requests. It performed fairly well at finding requests that are compliant, but it missed the far more costly ones that are non-compliant. We also found that it was very bad at citing the applicable policies and would often just hallucinate sections that didn't exist. After enterprise alignment using the programmatic workflow that we spoke about earlier, we improved response correctness. The model was far more capable at flagging non-compliant requests and we achieved uh, an over 20 point lift in detection accuracy. We also had a very big uh, improvement to uh, our reduction in citation hallucination rate. The model was far more capable of providing reasoning that cited the correct policy section. Within insurance, we have an LLM based assistant for automatic insurance claim handling. So we want to be able to feed claims data to this and flag if a claim is uh, applicable under the policy or whether it's invalid. And it needs to understand all the nuances and applicable sections of a fairly complex uh, insurance policy for automotive claims. Once again, we found that the base LLM didn't perform particularly well at flagging non-compliant or invalid insurance claims. And again, it was not very good at citing the applicable policies. After enterprise alignment using our synthetic data workflow, we improved response correctness and reduce hallucinations. And this is done without affecting the accuracy of identifying valid insurance claims. Within healthcare, we had codes of conduct documents and internal policies. And we wanted to create a policy aware chatbot for employees. It should be able to answer questions and provide answers that are compliant, so true to the underlying documents. It should follow the corporate tone, but it should also be perceived as being helpful. So this is different to the previous two tasks. Uh, so we're looking at compliance as one value evaluation dimension and then helpfulness as a more subjective evaluation dimension. And we're measuring these two using LLM as a judge. And what we found is we can improve the compliance of the responses without degrading the helpfulness of the responses. So quite useful for an internally deployed chatbot. You want it to be helpful and useful. When we were creating preference data, we were aligning for quite a narrow task. We wanted the LLM to identify behavior that was compliant or non-compliant and provide a reason. 
safe and compliant sort of full end-to-end -end systems need to be able to handle behaviors beyond just identifying those behaviors. And we want them to be useful more broadly. We want to understand if you can inject policy information into an LLM and use it for tasks that are unseen during training. I think one of the most exciting results we had was when we changed the system prompt to uh, not just respond to uh, user requests, but if it could uh, sort of carry them out. So we have here an example of a non-compliant user request that asks for some recommendations on how it should frame a status update. And these are non-compliant under the policy. Your off-the-shelf LLM, in this case, GPT-40, is very happy to produce some recommendations for the financial analysts. They include language that is not compliant under the policies. So this is a task that is unseen during training, and we, you can't just use an off-the-shelf LLM. Using the LLMs we specialize earlier through enterprise alignment, we can see that the non-compliant language is replaced with compliant language. So the policies have been instilled in the LLM and the LLM has been able to generalize beyond just the tasks it's seen during training and is useful at providing answers or answering questions, or in this case, providing recommendations uh, to a wider, a wider range of tasks. And we see this as a very, um, very exciting step forward to producing systems that are both safe and compliant within enterprise settings. So in summary, our synthetic data workflows that we've outlined earlier can be used to programmatically create preference data sets using organizational policies, codes of conduct, regulatory documents. These preference data sets can instill uh, compliant behavior into LLMs, moving them away from non-compliant responses. We've shown that specialization of a small LLM, so Mistral 7B in this case, is far, far smaller than GPT-40. And this can be achieved using Orpo and SPIN, helping to instill this policy information into the model. And then when measured on our downstream tasks within three domains, we see lifts of up to 20 points and above in detection accuracy for flagging non-compliant behavior. We're able to reduce hallucination rates the models are able to correctly cite the applicable sections of the policy documents. And very excitingly, we see generalization to task beyond those seen uh, during training. I'm now going to hand it over to Fred to talk about you know, what's next for Enterprise Alignment. Thanks, Tom, for walking us through all the exciting work that we've been up to on Enterprise Alignment. Um, I'm just going to briefly discuss a, a couple of hints about what we're up to next. Um, and I'll, I'll mention some of the upcoming releases for all of these results we've been talking about. Here's kind of a few themes for what we're thinking about next, and in fact, that we're tackling right now. Um, one is that we're going to take these approaches that Tom mentioned for programmatic data development for enterprise alignment. We're making these systematic, and we're making it possible to efficiently apply these for all kinds of settings. The other sort of piece that I think is really interesting that is also a very major challenge. And if you worked with kind of LLM powered systems in general, uh, you've probably struggled with, it's evaluation basically. And evaluation is quite complicated because we have these two extremes. One is manual evaluation, which doesn't scale up, unfortunately. The other is, and it's been very successful, kind of using a more powerful model as a judge. Um, but this can sometimes be tricky as well. Um, so we're working on systems that incorporate programmatic approaches here as well to developing data that can be used for high quality evaluation. And please stay tuned. We'll have a lot more on this coming out in the near future. Um, the other thing that I want to mention before we open up the floor for questions are some of the releases for the work that we talked about today. So all of these domain specific models for the three different scenarios that Tom described, they're all going to be open sourced and released. They'll be available on Hugging Face. Um, and as Tom mentioned, these are based on the Mistral model. We'll also release the preference data sets that we crafted, um, again, on Hugging Face as well. All right, everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. We were really excited to share some of the work on enterprise alignment that we've described. And now we're going to be ready to open up the floor and take some questions as well. OK, perfect. Uh, how many examples uh, do you need for effective alignment um, 
do you auto generate the questions as well or are those crafted by smes so in terms of how many examples it really depends on how strong your preference signal is so within the data sets we're releasing it's uh, about 10,000 examples for the given policy sets and if you look at uh, so general alignment data sets uh, so the anthropic harmless or helpful data set would be one example they have uh, sort of 100,000 plus examples, but the signal may be much noisier. And there was a question, uh, why not just prompt GPT-4.0 uh, to generate non-compliant responses? So we we did look at that and GPT-4.0 is very good at generating non-compliant responses. Uh, so that's something we explored during our experiments. Uh, we found that uh, the best results were achieved using SPIN, where the non-compliant results uh, were generated by the model itself that we are trying to align. Uh, we have a question. Um, I think there were some examples uh, in the presentation of alignment data sets. Maybe, I don't know if there's more that we want to share there, uh, just in case uh, folks want to know more examples. So in terms of enterprise alignment data sets, there's none that I can think of, but there's a lot of general alignment data sets. So uh, Anthropics, HH data set would be one. Uh, Ultra feedback would be another. Uh, I recommend having a look on Hugging Face and seeing what trending data sets are available for uh, general preference optimization. Um, I believe NVIDIA in their latest work cites uh, many high quality preference data sets for general alignment. So I'd recommend that as a resource. I'll add on to that, that uh, for NVIDIA's work, they also have a new data set called Help Steer. Um, so there's more of these for general alignment being released all the time. Um, but I will say that just using these will not necessarily be sufficient for enterprise alignment settings. I mean, that's one of the major takeaways for kind of what we've discussed today. Follow up question. Um, let's see, I think he has a first question. So let's go to the first question. Uh, can we achieve alignment for less complex compliant applications solely through few shot learning embedded within the system prompting using more advanced models like GPT-4.0? You can definitely achieve alignment through in-context learning and prompt engineering. However, it has its limits. A very robust strategy would be to combine in-context learning, prompt engineering, but with an enterprise LLM. Going back to what Fred uh, displayed earlier with that full LLM ops pipeline, you want to try and guardrail through improving every component there. And then the follow-up to that, I think, is uh, when do you think it would be appropriate to transition from few-shot learning and prompt engineering to fine-tuning? I think it's great to try and optimize through in-context learning and uh, prompt engineering, and you may start seeing a plateau in performance, or you may see failures, you know, perhaps in generalization or edge cases. And in that case, fine tuning can really improve your performance. We have a question uh, from Emily. At what stage or stages of AI lifecycle will, will the evaluations be applied? I think you can really apply them at all stages. So back in that sort of architectural diagram, you really want to optimize uh, everywhere. So in your prompt sanitization, your prompt classification, you can evaluate whether you're removing, say, harmful or non-compliant requests there. Maybe in your RAG system, you can evaluate if you're putting the correct policy sections into the context of your LLM. As we did, you can evaluate the ability of your LLM to respond to compliant and non-compliant requests. And then maybe you can evaluate your output classifiers. So evaluation can be applied at all stages and you, you really want to optimize for all stages to have a sort of an enterprise ready solution. And we have a question. Uh, have you evaluated the model's capabilities after your alignment to check whether the performance on generic tasks remain the same? We haven't looked extensively at say, uh, re-evaluating on MT bench or Alpaca Reba. There's a question, apart from the synthetic data, was there any human preference data used to do the alignment? What sort of cleaning quality vetting was performed on the synthetic data generated? So this piece was purely synthetic, but we're not creating data out of nothing. Sometimes we have in-context examples of compliant or non-compliant behavior. So that would be human generated, but that was uh, sort of a, a rarity. We're grounding our synthetic data generation in the actual policies. So while the data at the end is synthetic, it's grounded in, in real policy documents. Another question, uh, have you measured reductions in citation hallucin hallucination rates? Yeah, so this is actually a great use of the Snorkel Flow platform. So you can, you can measure whether citations 
are included or not, you can frame that as a span extraction task. So this is a great use for snorkel flow, where we extract any mentions of things that look like a citation, and then we can measure those against some ground truth data. So what should the actual citation be? Is it relevant or not? For those who may not be super familiar with uh, Snorkel and Snorkel Flow, uh, Snorkel Flow is our uh, AI data development platform. So of course, if you would like to see a demo or learn more about it for your use case, you can always request a demo at snorkel.ai slash demo. So I'll make a short plug there. I don't think we have an answer on this one, but just in case, are you aware of any data sets for alignment in heavy industries such as oil and gas manufacturing or similar? I think most of this is pretty new, but are either you aware of uh, any? Yeah, my guess would be that there isn't really something that's publicly usable for such a custom kind of case. And that's actually exactly the motivation for the kind of work that we're doing. It's going to permit you to efficiently craft those preference data sets. What is the intuition of using Maestral or Mixtral 7B as the uh, weaker model to tune? Really, it's a, it's a very popular model. And we, we start off with the instruction fine-tune variant, which is pretty good at instruction following to begin with. Uh, but this workflow can be applied to any base model you want, whether it's smaller or larger in size, um, whether it's been instruction fine-tuned or not. So uh, really just because of the popularity of the model. And there's a question. Uh, seems like the workflow is targeting several industries. How is out-of-domain vocab handled? So we, we are targeting specific industries, but uh, we find that the, the models out of the box have a, a decent understanding of the vocabulary used in those industries. And the, the tokenizer is equipped to handle that. I don't see any other questions coming in. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Fred, for another great presentation today. And with that, I wish everyone a great rest of their day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.